Okay, good afternoon. This is Monday, March 15th, our class session for Math 208. And we're just returning from spring break. So I hope you had a restful spring break. I had a fairly decent spring break myself, especially with the nicer weather. Where we left off last time, and you have some homework that's coming due, we'll scan our website in a second, is we were discussing confidence intervals. So how do you express confidence in a conclusion of a population parameter when you take only a sample of that population? And there's multiple ways to express confidence in your prediction. We were talking about confidence intervals before the break. Now we're gonna talk about hypothesis testing. And these are really two sides of the same coin. So I want to show you how to look at both of these figures and see how you can see the results of expressing a level of confidence in the sample statistic in either way. And then later this week and into next week, we'll get into some more sophisticated hypothesis testing. So let's scan our website for a second, just to make sure after the week off that we're kind of all on the same page. I'm gonna bring up my website and then share the screen with you. So got that, got that. Let me share screen here. And trying to make sure I have all my cameras turned on correctly because I haven't done this for a week. So let's name this with that paper. And we're recording the paper. That's good. So now let's switch to a browser. Okay, so we're looking at the browser right here. Maybe I'll pump up the words so they're a little bit larger and easier to read. I might bring in another screen to help me see this too. But we're back in Math 208 and we're here in week 10. Uh, just to survey what's coming up after we work for a couple weeks on hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Chapter eight, confidence intervals, chapter nine and 10, hypothesis testing. Then we're setting up for another exam in week 12. So just keep in mind that the exam's on the horizon there. Here we are in week 10. And we're talking about the basics of hypothesis testing. And the homework that you're going to hand in tomorrow night by 11.59 is homework seven that dealt with confidence intervals. So there's three examples here of confidence interval problems in this homework seven. Let me pull up this homework seven just for a second. So confidence intervals where you know the population standard deviation, that's the first problem. Confidence intervals where you do not know the sample standard deviation, that's the second problem. And then confidence interval for a population proportion, that's the third problem. Now, before I we went to the break, I promised you an example of a confidence interval for a population proportion. And I have that set up on our website. I wanna show you where that is. So if you're still working on these problems for tomorrow night, that's okay. And if you want a comparison or an example to help you with 8.3, I put up two problems on our website that might help you. So let's go back to our website. And to reach those two problems from section 8.3, we're gonna to have to go backwards in time here, not to week nine. There was no content on week nine, but let's go back to week eight before we left for a break. That's where we discussed sections eight one, eight two, and eight three. So notice in section eight three here, I have two of these recommended problems linked. So that means I posted solutions to those two problems that you could compare and read about 
and that might help you do the written homework problem from 8.3. So if you follow this link to problem 117, here's an example, and we're gonna do something a little bit like this today for practice 117 and problem 118. I'm gonna look at problem 118 more closely in terms of confidence interval and in terms of hypothesis testing. Okay, so let's get going on that. So I just wanted to remind you of what your homework was for tomorrow night. And then come tomorrow, I'll post another homework here from chapter nine and 10. I wanna go back to week eight for a second. And in chapter nine, you were reading about hypothesis testing, just the vocabulary. And we're gonna do an example in a second, but you can look at the notes we posted here for section nine, one and nine, two. Basically hypothesis testing is another way of expressing confidence about a population parameter. Oh, let me bring in another thing so I can make sure that I'm recording what I think I'm recording. And you're seeing what I think you're seeing. So I want to bring in another screen here. Give me a second. I'm going to let this screen join our presentation. Got it. And I just want to make sure I'm sharing this website here. So let me back out of this and start sharing that again. And I want to make sure my network is connected properly because well, my apologies i haven't done this for a week so i got to make sure i have everything set up together okay so basically just to review from section 91 before we left for break hypothesis testing is another way of expressing an estimate of a population parameter and hypothesis testing basically says you are studying a population and you have a belief that this population has a certain quality or parameter. Maybe you're certain that the population mean is such a number or the population proportion is such a number. 60% of the people support the spill in Congress. And you'd like to test whether that belief is legitimate or not. So you sample randomly a bunch of people on the street, maybe in a park, or maybe you pay someone to perform a sophisticated phone survey. And you collect data on how many people support that bill in Congress. Does the data that you collected match what you believe? That's called a hypothesis test. And if the data that you collected seems different than your belief, maybe you surveyed the people on the phone and 62% supported the bill, but you think only 60% supported the bill. That small variation might be within the nature of your simple random sample. 
So you want to know if the test you perform on a sample is significantly different than what you think the population parameter is. So that's called a hypothesis test. And if that difference is too rare and too unlikely to be held to only random chance, then maybe your belief that 60% of the people support that bill in Congress, maybe your belief is incorrect and you have to reject that belief. So hypothesis testing at its core says, you make a statement regarding the nature of a population. 60% of the people support this bill. Then you collect evidence to test your statement. You analyze the data to determine whether your statement is realistic or not. And since you can't be 100% certain, you can say that the data support your belief or they don't support your belief. And these are the two hypotheses called the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And if the data you collect is different than what you believe, but that difference is not possible to attribute to, attribute to just random probability, then maybe, maybe your belief is incorrect and you have to reject that belief. You have to reject what people call the null hypothesis. We'll give a demonstration of this in a second. Now think about this, when you are stating a belief, and let me give you an example on a piece of paper of these errors that I'm describing. I'll switch back to my paper and share this paper with you. And I got that and I got that. Okay, very good. So uh, I got a report in the chat of someone having an issue with the screen. Is that better now? Are you looking at my paper right now? Well, I think I'm sharing the paper with you and I think I'm recording the paper. I just want to check to make sure that you see the paper now. If you're having an issue, you can still post to the chat and tell me that you're still having an issue. Okay, there it goes. Very good. So let's say that you have a belief in some hypothesis and let's use a classical example from a legal term. We have a defendant in the courtroom and you believe that defendant is innocent. Now, your belief could be true or it could be false. And the verdict of the jury could be guilty or not guilty. Do you see that there's four independent things that could happen here? This defendant could be innocent. And the jury agrees with you. In that case, you would say the jury reached a correct result. But your belief that the defendant is innocent could be false. The defendant may not be innocent. And then if the jury convicts them of the crime, then what is the jury doing? The jury is rejecting your belief that the defendant is innocent. If the jury affirms the truth, if the jury believes, does not find the defendant guilty and the defendant is in fact innocent, that's good. So if your hypothesis is true, and the jury does not reject that hypothesis, you consider that to be a correct decision. Another correct decision would be, what if the defendant is not innocent and the jury rejects the innocence of the defendant? 
that's also a correct outcome. And that means, let me adjust this piece of paper right here. That's also a correct outcome. And you're satisfied with that. But notice that there are two errors you can make when you study a hypothesis. Let's suppose the defendant is innocent and the jury rejects that innocence. The jury convicts an innocent person you would call that a bad result. Notice you would also call it a bad result if the defendant was in fact not innocent, but the jury finds them innocent. So let's say your hypothesis is the defendant is innocent and the jury agrees with you. They do not reject that innocence. But what if the person was not innocent? What if the person had committed the crime? That's also a bad result. So when you have a hypothesis, it could be true or false, and your test could either fail to reject the hypothesis or reject the hypothesis. So you have four things that can happen. Consider the case of a defendant in a courtroom. Notice that these two errors have different weights. If the defendant is innocent, but the jury finds them guilty, you know, generally we consider that worse than the defendant being guilty and the jury considering them innocent. In fact, we put a high priority, so we say, on not convicting innocent people. And so if some people who are not as innocent actually are labeled as innocent or go free, we consider that kind of bad, but we consider it very bad if someone was innocent and convicted by a jury. These are examples of what people call type one error and type two error. If your hypothesis is true, but you accidentally reject it, that's called a type one error, or you mistakenly reject the hypothesis, that's called a type one error. If your hypothesis is false, but you actually label it as true, that's called a type two error. If your hypothesis is false and you do not reject it, that's called a type two error. Before I go down to the next example here, I just want to correct this. Let's look at another example to show you sometimes the type one error is the worst case scenario. It's the thing that we consider very bad. And the type two error is bad, but not as bad. Sometimes it's reversed. Sometimes the type two error is very bad and the type one error is just moderately bad. Let's take a medical example right here. Let's say the doctor believes the patient is cancer free. And I'm just speaking very generally. I, I understand that there's different kinds of cancers and there's different severities of cancer. So, I'm not talking about what kind of cancer a patient has. You could name anything that you're familiar with or you've read about or heard on the news. But let's say a patient, the doctor believes the patient is cancer-free. That's the doctor's hypothesis. The doctor could be correct or incorrect. It could be true that the patient is cancer-free. It could be false that the patient is cancer-free. The doctor performs a medical test and that medical test either confirms her belief or it contradicts her belief. If the patient is cancer-free 
and the medical test confirms that, we consider that to be good. You know, the patient has been advised that they're cancer free. They actually are cancer free. And so no harm is done in that situation. But if the patient is cancer free, but the test comes back showing cancer, and that happens from time to time, we consider that kind of bad. And I mean kind of bad in the sense that the patient does not have cancer, their health is not threatened, but they certainly, when that test comes back, say, oh, positive for cancer, that patient certainly has some anxiety generated in them. And maybe the doctor has to order another test to confirm the first test. But if the patient is cancer-free and the test comes back and says, no, you have cancer, even though the patient is cancer-free, that's an incorrect result. That's a type one error. It's relatively bad. But let's look at a worse problem. What if the doctor believes the patient is cancer-free and it's not true that the patient actually has cancer? And the doctor orders a test and the test says, cancer-free. The test is mistaken. So now we're in a situation where the patient is not cancer-free, but the test says they are cancer-free. That would probably be considered a very bad result. If the patient has a form of cancer and it needs treatment, but the test says there's no cancer here, there's no cancer present, then the patient's gonna continue with a condition that needs to be treated and they're unaware of it. So I want you to compare these two things. This is what the nature of a hypothesis test is. A hypothesis test says you believe something is true or false. You have some basic hypothesis that you want to test. And if it's true and your test says it's quite possible that it's true, you think that's a correct outcome. If your hypothesis is false and the test says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you should reject that hypothesis. There's strong evidence that you're incorrect. We also consider that good because we've uncovered an error. But the other two things that can happen could be serious or just mildly serious. If your hypothesis is true, but your test tells you that it's not, or your test makes you believe that it's not, that's called a type one error. If your hypothesis is false, but your test leads you to believe that it's true, that's called a type two error. Let me give you another example. Let's talk about chemicals, maybe chemicals in water supply or something like that. Let's say that you have a test for a certain pollution or chemical in a water supply. And that test is, this toxic material is more than 800 micrograms per kilogram. So there's some significant amount of toxic material present. If you perform the test on that water and the test comes back and says, yes, that toxic material is present, then you're going to take action to reduce that toxic material. Your hypothesis was toxic material is present. Your test says, yes, we believe toxic material is present. That's considered a good result. What if your hypothesis was toxic material is present, but the test comes back negative, toxic material is not present. Well, if the toxic material is indeed present, but the test says that it's not, that's probably very bad. 
there's something in the water supply, but we believe that there's nothing in the water supply. Or what happens if the toxic material is not present, but we believe it is. Well, that's kind of bad. I mean, we're gonna be alerting people, we're gonna be changing the water supply, but there's no actual threat to the people. What happens if the toxic material is not present and the test says that it is not present? That's actually good. We've confirmed that we thought the toxic material is present, we've confirmed that it's not, or we say there's sufficient evidence that it's not. The book used this not as a toxic material in water, but as a toxic material in shellfish. So if we were living on the coast, east or west coast, sometimes the oysters and oyster farmers have bacteria or some chemicals present in the oysters or shellfish that they're farming. So if the shellfish do have a toxic material, but you believe that they're actually safe, that's a very bad result. People are gonna become sick. If the shellfish are safe, but you believe that they're toxic, that's just a moderately bad result. You're gonna pull the shellfish from the markets. You're not gonna sell any, even though it was good. So people lost out on the ability to buy the shellfish but no one was physically harmed. So in this case, a type one error is worse. Let's illustrate hypothesis test with two different examples. And I'm going to use first test comparing hypothesis test and confidence intervals. I'm going to use this problem 8.3 number 118 that I've posted an answer to. Let's say that you believe that 85% of drivers always buckle up before they drive. Now in most states, it's the law that you must wear a seatbelt while you're driving. And I think most people do that. Maybe there are some people that don't. And you'd like to decide how many people do that? So let's say you believe that 85% of the people always buckle up before they drive. Let's say you perform a survey, a simple random sample. And we're not gonna discuss how you do it, phone interview, uh, interview of, of certain population at an event. You perform a simple random sample of 400 people, 400 drivers, and let's say that 320 of these drivers say yes, I always buckle up before I drive. Buckle up is a, just a common colloquial term, right? Wearing a seatbelt, using a seatbelt is what we're testing. But when you drive down the highway and you see a billboard that tells you to buckle up, that means you're wearing a seatbelt. 
Now let's think about this. You surveyed 400 people. And 320 of them say they buckled up. Now you can do the math really quickly. What proportion is that? This is your sample proportion. Your sample proportion is 320 out of 400. And just as things happen, that's exactly 80%. If you pop that into a calculator, you get exactly 80%. Doesn't matter how many decimal places or zeros I use. That's 80%. But now you're nervous because you believe that 85% of the drivers always buckle up. That's what the insurance company says. That's what the New York Times says. That's what you heard on CNN. So now you've got this contradiction facing you, this possible contradiction. You were told that 85% of the drivers buckle up. You sampled a large number of people and only 80% say they buckled up. What could be the problem here? What's the contradiction? Is this difference just random chance? Or do that people that reported 85% buckling up to you, maybe they're wrong. Now the difference could be random chance, right? You may have just surveyed 400 people and the wrong number of them said they buckled up, right? Maybe you just surveyed people that were a little bit less careful. Is this difference random chance or is the 85% population parameter incorrect. Now we could test this two ways. We can test this with a confidence interval. Or we can test this with a hypothesis test. Let's look at both of these and compare how they work. The confidence interval test is closer to what you're doing on the homework for tomorrow night. The hypothesis test is what we're going to be practicing this week. So let's do this with the confidence interval. So I have a certain proportion that I got from my sample, 80%. That was a sample of 400 people. Excuse me, I gotta move my paper up here. That was a sample of 400 people and 320 of them said, yes, I always buckle up. <clears throat> so you believe the proportion that always buckles up is 80%. Now let's say that you wanted in both cases to use like 95% confidence in your conclusion. You have to preset what you believe that confidence is. you'd like to say that you're 95% confident. That means that your possible error is 5%. And you're going to construct 
a confidence interval of your sample proportion, 80%, plus or minus an error bound. The error bound for this proportion is based on the idea that you're using a normal distribution. When you ask people, do you buckle up yes or no? This is like a flipping a coin. It's like a binomial test, except it's not equally yes and no. This is a normal distribution where you have measured a proportion of 80%. And from the binomial distribution, you have a standard deviation based on the rate of people saying yes, they buckle up, based on the rate of people saying no, they buckled up, and the number of people in the survey. Here, that is 80%. I don't need these zeros to express 80%, but I'm just in the habit of expressing things in four digits. And what you believe for the standard deviation is 80% said yes, 20% said no, and you're surveying 400 people. This is a normal distribution that we can draw with our calculator or with the computer. Now we calculate this error bound of the percentage. We'll draw this in a second. We calculate this error bound of percentage by saying in a standard normal distribution, what percent would be outside the norm. P prime Q prime over N. And we do this, I'm gonna to have to move to the next paper. We do this with the distribution functions on our calculator. Let me see if I can get these two things on the same side. We'll do the hypothesis test side by side with it in a second. So here we're still constructing the confidence interval. So the Z alpha over two, remember alpha is 0 0.05. So this is from our calculator, how much area is under a normal distribution on the right-hand side, 0 0.975. Now remember this 5% is the alpha. So that's 2.5% on the right and 2.5% on the left. So how much area is in that normal distribution? If the population proportion is 80%, and I'm squeezing this in here when I shouldn't. The standard deviation is the square root of 0.8 times 0.2 divided by 400. If we run this on our calculator, let me clear the screen off and I'll show it to you in the calculator under the distribution function. This is the inverse normal command. It's the third command down here. Area 0.975. And the mean from our survey is 0.8. And the standard deviation from our survey is 0.8 times 0 0.2 divided by 400. I could use my on-screen calculator too here, and I think I'll go to that in a second. But 
I already started this. So this Z value is calculated by the computer. It's 0 0.8392. I round this off, 0.8392. And then the error bound of the percentage, this is 0.8392 times the square root of P prime Q prime over N. So I'm transitioning to the next paper here. 0 0.8392 times 0 0.8. 0 0.2 divided by 400. Now notice that I've rounded off in this 0 0.8392. I don't have to round off at all. I can just type in this command and keep all the digits of this times the square root. And there's no harm in doing that. I'll just go up to this command that I gave, highlight it, and hit enter, and then multiply it by the square root of 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 divided by 400. So really, you shouldn't be rounding things off yourself. You should be using exactly what the calculator gives you. And you don't have to do anything fancy in order to do that. You just use the commands directly on the calculator. Let's see what this error bound is. 0 0.0168. I'm, again, I'm rounding off, but let's call it 0 0.0168. Now that's 1.68%. 1.68%. Uh, I, I definitely was rounding off. But now I can state my confidence interval and draw some graphs and show you what I should believe, what I think I should believe. So my confidence interval is P prime plus the error bound of the proportion, P prime minus the error bound of the proportion. And the P prime was 0 0.8 minus 0 0.0168. I'm just filling in the blanks here, but we'll do the arithmetic in a second, 0 0.168. And that gives me these two numbers, right? Uh, it's easier to add than subtract sometimes. This is 0 0.168. So this is 8, 1, 6, 8.0. 8168 or 81.68%. Let's express it as a percent. And this is 78.32%. This is my confidence interval. I am, what does this mean in English? 95% certain, I am 95% confident that the true proportion of drivers that buckle up is between 78.3%, I'm rounding again, and 81.7%. What does that mean for the story that I heard on CNN? Or what does that mean for the insurance company estimate that I read in the newspaper? Uh, let's just stick with insurance company estimate from newspaper. The insurance company said 
that 85% of the drivers buckle up before they drive. And I cannot survey all the drivers in the United States or whatever country I'm talking about, let's assume it's the United States. But my sample says it's not quite that high. My sample says the true proportion must be between 78.3% and 81.7%. What does that mean? I think it's very unlikely that 85% of the drivers buckle up. How unlikely? Well, that's what the confidence level comes in. I am 95% confident that the true proportion of the drivers is actually between 78.3 and 81.7. What does that confidence level mean? You know, I could be making an error, but for me to be making an error on this, it'd be very rare, you know, 5% of the time, I would be incorrect with this estimate. That means what? If I surveyed 400 people over and over and over again, 95% of the time, I would reject this news story. That 85% of drivers buckle up. Why would I reject it? Because my sample has given me evidence to believe otherwise. My sample allowed me to construct this confidence interval that says, no, 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 the true proportion is not that high. Now, what does this look like in a graph? I'm thinking about all the drivers in the United States, I'm trying to draw a normal curve here. In my sample, I had 80% as the mean. And with my error proportion, I am 95% certain that the truth lies between 78.3 and 81.7, where I'm reasonably sure that if I repeated this over and over again, the truth would lie in here. Now you say that area doesn't represent 95% of this normal curve. Well, yes, I agree, but I think that the average, that the proportion of drivers who always buckle up should be this close to 80%. The news story says that average was 85%. Now that could be way over here, right? And I say to myself, no, that's far outside of my proportion. That's far outside of my estimate. Now let's do this with a hypothesis test and see what that looks like. And then we can come back and draw these graphs. So it's kind of odd that I'm traveling from one paper to another, right? But I wanted to compare these side by side. Let's construct a hypothesis test to see if I believe that 85% of drivers always buckle up. So this statement, 80% of drivers, I'm abbreviating, always buckle up. This is what we call my null hypothesis. Null hypothesis just means that's the thing I'm testing that is 
the thing I was told. I'm going to accept this as the truth unless I can produce evidence otherwise. Now, evidence otherwise means what? That's called the alternative hypothesis. That would be 85% of drivers do not always buckle up. Now notice that could be more than 85% buckle up or less than 85% buckle up. So let's write this in math sentence. H naught is called the null hypothesis, no change, zero change. So that would be the proportion is 85%. And the alternative hypothesis, this book writes A for alternative, would be that this is not true. 85% of the people do not buckle up before they drive. Okay, how am I gonna test this? What I want to do is construct what's called, this is the hypothesis test continuing down on the next sheet of paper. This is called a two tailed test. In this view, I was told that 85% of drivers always buckle up. But I have this evidence from my survey that it may not be 85. I want to tell whether that's random based on the size of my survey or not random. My sample, like before, has 400 people and only 320 said they always buckle up. That's a proportion of 80%, not 85%. So let's go back to why I call this a two-tailed test. I believe the proportion, or I was told the proportion is 85. Based on my sample, I'm not sure if that's true. That's my alternative hypothesis. Uh, the sample could be more or less, but this time it's less. But I'm saying with 95% confidence, how could I tell where that 80% lands in this drawing? That means I could have 5% error on the right, or I could have 5%, sorry, 2.5% error on the right or 2.5% error on the left. The 2.5 and the 2.5 add up to 5% error. That's a 95% confidence. The error is 5%. Okay. So what am I assuming about this distribution? I'm assuming the distribution is normal and that 85% of drivers always buckle up. And for the standard deviation, if I surveyed 400 people, then I should see a standard deviation of 85% saying yes, 15% saying no, divided by 400 and square root. Let's figure out what this number is. 
And then we're going to go draw it on the calculator and computer in a second. So let's take the square root of 0.85 times 0.15 divided by 400. And that's 0. Point. Slide my paper up. 0. 0.0179. That's the standard deviation, 1.7% out of 85. That means plus or minus 1.7%, I should see a large chunk of people. Plus or minus two times 1.7%, I should see another large chunk of people. One point seven percent, double that. Three point. This is almost one point eight percent. Three point six percent. That's not down to eighty percent. Add another one point eight. What's three times one point eight? That's five percent. A little more than five percent, and I've finally dipped down into my eighty. Right. So if my 80% is correct, I'm gonna to have to go three standard deviations from the mean. That is gonna be kind of rare. Now let's find out exactly how rare. So what would happen if I asked for the area, the normal cumulative distribution function in the left-hand side, because my 80% here is down south of 85%, less than 85%. So minus one times 10 to the 99th. So negative infinity, so to speak. Up to 0 0.8, 80 80%. If my mean is 85% and my standard deviation is 0, 0,179. Notice I am rounding off on that standard deviation, right? So we'll do it rounded off and not rounded off if you like later, just to see that I'm still getting a relatively accurate result. This number, this probability this probability that the proportion is 80% or less. That's called the P value, the probability value. Let's calculate that on our calculator. So what's the distribution? I'll move this over to the side. Normal distribution function, normal cumulative distribution function, lower bound minus one times e to the 99th, so like negative infinity, upper bound 0.8, but the mean is 0.85 and the standard deviation, I could type in the exact value here, or I could type in the 0 0.0179. I want to show you that they're not much different. So first I'll type in the exact value. I'm using those three decimal places. I'm in pretty good shape. 0 0.85 times 0 0.15 divided by 400. That probability is 0 0.0025. Now let's think about that as a percentage. Remember you move the decimal place two places a percentage. That is less than 1%. That p-value, that probability is 0.25%. 
And what was I allowing for error? 2.5%. That means that this p-value of 0.8 is way down here. So since the p-value is less than my alpha over two, the p-value is 0 0.0025, and the alpha over two is 0 0.025. I mean, they're both very small. But notice this says 2.5%, this says 0.25%. Then what should I do? I think that this survey I conducted indicates there's a serious problem. I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Now let's carefully consider what that means. But to reject the null hypothesis means, I think that there's evidence that 85% of the people do not buckle up. Because my survey was relatively large and only showed 80% of the people buckling up. Go back to my distribution over here. Isn't that the same conclusion I came to over here? Over here, I said, wait a minute. My survey says that the people who always buckle up is between 78% and 82% roughly. I don't believe that story that I read in the paper. This is the same experiment, but it's done in the language of a hypothesis test. The newspaper told me 85% of the people always buckle up. I took my own sample. And I only found that 80% of the people buckled up. Now something is wrong because that 80% is so unlikely. What's the probability that I just accidentally found 80% of the people? That probability is 0 0.0025, less than one, well, about one quarter of 1%. I have to seriously doubt what I read in the newspaper. I could say it like this. At the 95% confidence level, There is significant evidence that what? The statement that 85% of the people always buckle up is incorrect. Eighty-five percent of drivers always buckle up. Is not true. Now, notice a couple things about my conclusion here. I'm still hedging my bets. And by that, I mean what? I didn't outright say that the people who told me 85% were lying or incorrect. All I'm saying is I have strong evidence to believe that they are incorrect. I really don't believe they're correct. I can't prove anything, right? In that sense, I can't prove anything because I may have just surveyed the wrong 400 people. 
Do you know how easy it is to do that? It's very easy. Let's say that, uh, you know, the insurance company says 85% of the people always buckle up. And I tested it by testing 400 people at the local high school. Is it the case that if I surveyed only high school students, it could be a smaller percentage of them that always buckle up? Okay, I don't wanna get into stereotypes. That's not a good way to argue, right? But it's quite possible that among high school students, not as many people always buckle up. Well, then what's wrong? Is it the news article I read or is it my sampling method? Oh, I didn't do a very good sampling method. I didn't do a true, honest, random sample of all the drivers. I only surveyed a certain type of driver and that is a high school student. So notice how I'm gonna be very careful. My sample says that 85% is wrong. Am I sure that I took a good sample? But let's, let's, let's say that I did it really well, that I surveyed drivers across all age groups, that I surveyed drivers in big cities as well as out in the country, so to speak, that I, sur that I surveyed drivers completely randomly. If that's true, if my sample was a simple random sample, then what did I just find? There is strong evidence that the 85% number is an error. How strong? If I kept doing these tests 95% of the time, I would not be able to say that my sample was close enough to 85% to be just simple random chance. Okay, I want you to see both of these drawings. And so I think right now, even though we're only doing one problem here as a sample, I want to see on the computer screen or on the calculator screen, I want you to see both of these drawings. So first of all, let me put them onto paper together. In both cases, I'm trying to draw a normal distribution, right? And my problem is I'm not a good drawer. That's why I want the calculator to draw it. But this looks like a bell-shaped curve. Okay, it's fair. And the survey said 85% of the people always buckle up, but I only found way down here, 80%. That 80% was what, according to my calculations, about three standard deviations down, roughly. So the probability that only 80% buckled up always, said they buckled up always, was about 0 0.25%. And I was drawing the line, I was drawing the line at, you know, 2.5%, wherever that is. That is way below my error bound. This is the hypothesis test. This picture up here, was what I called the confidence interval. This picture up here was a drawing to express that I believed the true answer should be between 78.32 and 81.68. In that case, where is this 85%? Do you see again, 
It's way outside the norm. It's way outside the norm. And that means what? I don't believe that this 85% is true, at least based on my sample. Now let's go and draw this on the TI-84. And this time I'm gonna use my computer screen and I'm not going to use the uh, calculator in front of the camera because it's just not large enough to see. But let's draw these two diagrams on the TI-84 just to show you how to draw them. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up my calculator on computer screen here, just a second. I gotta clean up some of my windows. And let's make this a little bit larger. And before I do this, I'm going to clear off some other work I was doing before I share the screen with you so I don't confuse the issue here. Good. Uh, let me make this a little bit larger. Make that. Before I share it with you, let's clear the screen. Got it. Quit. Clear. Good. Okay, now let me share this with you and let's type it in our calculator. Okay, we'll get rid of these keystrokes. I want to draw those two curves on my calculator screen. So let's go to the distribution. That's where I can draw the probability density function, the normal function, the standard normal distribution. I'm going to put them here under my y equals menu. Okay, I must have been working with something else, so let me delete that and delete that. So these are two different curves, mind you. These are two different curves. So I'll put them in Y1 and Y2, one red, one blue. So let's put, I did them in order where blue was the confidence interval and red was the hypothesis test. So let's do it in that order, but I'll change these colors. So I'll make this one blue. And I'll make this one red. Otherwise, it kind of ruins your concentration if I say blue, but I draw red. OK, so for the first curve, let's draw the 80 the mound with a mean at 80 percent. So you go up here. I say second function distribution, normal probability distribution function. To draw it on my screen, the value is X, excuse me, I have to hit the X button. But the mean that my survey measured was 80%. And the standard deviation with that was going to be square root of 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 divided by 400. Now, I've got a problem here. Say like, I don't know where this is gonna come out on my graph. So if I just say graph right now, I could get some crazy, crazy window. Look at that. I did get some crazy, crazy window. So I think I should change this window so that it makes sense to me. If the standard deviation is about 0.2-ish, let's figure out what the square root is. Square root of 0.8 times 0.2 divided by 400. 0.2-ish. Then let's do a window that goes from 0.8 couple times down and a couple times up. 
So let's say 0 0.74 and let's say 0 0.86. And my scale will mark it at 1%. So I'll make my markings at 1%. And then let's try to graph this. This is still not gonna work, but I'll show you what's gonna happen. Yeah, okay. I might have a bell-shaped curve, but my window is very, very bad. So let's try that window again. Let's try 0 0.7, sorry, 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. Let's still count by 1%. This is still going to be bad, but at least I've got it within the window now. What's bad about it now? Bad height. Bad height. Now remember, this whole area has got to be under this curve 1. So if I have 0.2 from left to right, what do I have to multiply 0.2 by to get 1? Five times 0.2 is about one. So this graph might go up to five. I have no idea what these markings are. Let's look at the window. Yeah, this is 0.5. I rather want this to be five. And let's go down minus one. And let's say, sorry. Let's go down. I have to use the minus key on the bottom of my keyboard, minus one. And let's say my scale will be one. Let's see how that graph looks. Oh, it's still not too good because this is even snugger in here. Let's go to window and choose some safe value like 20. <coughs> oh, that was just kind of a lucky guess. And it seemed to be perfectly fitting my window. Uh, I won't argue with it here since it fits in the window. But remember, this right here is 80 dead center. So where is 85? No, I'm counting by ones. Center of the window is 80%, counting by 1% each time. That means this is 80% in the middle, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85. Yes, this 85 is very small area. What was my confidence interval. Let's do the calculation. It was 78.32. Let's shade the area. 0 0.7832 all the way up to 0 0.8168, that was the number we calculated, 0 0.8168. That was where I expected the proportion to be. And where's 85%? 85% is way over here. 85% is the X value way over here. So I don't believe that 85% at all. Let's look at it from the other point of view. Let's look at it from the point of view of the red graph where I take 85% to be the truth and then see where my sample lands. So cumulative distribution, let's change this to 85%. Let's change this to insert and we're at the top of our time so i'm just going to draw this and then we'll call it a day one insert five and let's graph that in red notice that's over here let me keep the two graphs on the screen at the same time. Let me change the window size so this looks a little bit better. Let's change this up to be even as high as 30. And then let's count by fives.
So the blue thing represents the confidence interval. The red thing represents what I was told. Remember the center of this red thing is 85. But I measured my sample was 80. So if I shaded the area up to 80, up to this point right here, let's shade that area. Calculate area from the left-hand side. I'm gonna shade under the right curve. From the left-hand side is 0 0.7 up to 0 0.8. You don't even see it on the screen. There's just a little tiny shading in there. If the truth is 85, if the truth is that the center of the distribution is 85, then my 80% from my survey is so far away from that truth. I think either my sample is bad or the 85% is bad. I've got to reject one of those two ideas. Let's shade the blue curve between my confidence interval again. And then we'll call it a day. Let's shade this blue curve from 0 0.7832 to 0 0.8168. Yeah, that 85% is so far out of the range of that. I'm going to shade the red curve again on top of the blue curve just so you can see it at the same time. 0 0.7 0 0.8. See that red area is so far down here, or this 85% right here. I could shade the blue curve at 85% or above. That is so unlikely. Let's shade the blue curve. 85% or above, 0 0.85, and all the way up to the end of the screen, which was 0 0.9 in the screen. See, that interval was so small. They're about the same size, aren't they? Aren't they telling you that both of these readings tell you the same thing? You do not believe that 85% is correct. OK. That was an intense problem. That was a problem of population proportion. You can also do hypothesis testing for sample means. And we'll do some example of that next time if you like. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And I'm going to wrap up this recording. Did, just to help me test, did you see, because you had problems seeing the screen earlier, did you see the calculator screen well? Just throw a thumbs up or something in the chat if you got that calculator screen on the recording. Okay, very good. Okay, this problem that we just did is gonna help you out a lot in your third homework problem for this week. So refer to these notes, refer to this recording, refer to the problem 118 that we did. This is what we sampled right here. And that'll help you do the third homework problem. As always, if you have a question, you can send me an email and I'll help you out. But I'm going to terminate this recording and see you guys later. Have a good day.